it. <laughs> there we go. I'm gonna grab this guy. Show him the folder. There we go. And so we're gonna take our T pose and have a look at it, right? So I'm gonna put this away for just a second. I'm gonna come over to my downloads and ground download the T pose that I just had. Maybe I might rename it. Uh, CB live. Oops. There we go. See live T pose. And return name. It is right. So that'll be our T pose, and I'll take this, and I'm simply going to drag and drop this FPX here on top of Marmoset. And just to set this for some of the others, when I put animations on it, it's not going to look as goofy here under the arms. But um, let's try and take the textures and apply them. All right. So I've baked out some of the textures already. Um, so I'm just going to bring in the material that I've already made. And I'll show you how I set them up. Hey, there we go. And one more. I think it's the Zordi material. And so I have two material sets here. Uh, both were made from the Unreal template. So if you click here on this icon here in Marmoset uh, Render, it actually has other materials, uh, material templates that you can use and alter, like glass, iron. There's a few uh, Quixel materials built into here, and particularly there's one for Unreal 4. And if I drag and drop this on top of the model, I can then start to set up all of the maps inside of this. So I've already done this once before, so I'm gonna, and I've saved the material inside of Marmoset. So it's just basically calling out the textures in one material. So I'm going to drag and drop this on top of the mesh. And because it uses the same UV space, there's our texture. And then the same for the boots. For this, I can if I make it move and it sticks out, I suppose I could take it and separate it and just uh, pull a little bit of the, the T-posed mesh for this. You can just uh, pull that polygroup out so that it doesn't intersect. It usually, it, it didn't do that before when I baked it because I think I added the object afterwards and maybe scaled it so that it would fit a little bit. I think it's need to, just a little tweaking there. But um, pretty much, those are the textures. And it's just a simple bake. It's not uh, super fabulous, but I did it really quick to see how fast I could put the, the model and character together. And so, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, all Of course, all of these textures here uh, are plugged and played so like the displacement map I would go and I just get to probably here and in here and in the flats so I have like a, an albedo an AO a height a metallic normal and roughness and when I make these I could just say for example uh, cancel that drag this over to here and say for example pick a normal go and find your maps like so I have mine here and let's say we start with normal and you put that on and as you can see it starts to unfold I think that's actually the wrong map for that strangely enough but that's basically what these are. They're called out to each each texture, right, in the right place. Uh, displacement doesn't need to be super high, or sometimes it can break, look a little bit weird. So just scale it down appropriately. It should probably just have just barely a little bit of effect. You don't want to hit it some, or, you know, too hard because sometimes uh, it seems to pull the geo or displace the geo off a little bit. But I think I had it set just. So there's enough bump in some of the normal maps uh, and some of the fine detail like on the skin so that if you look at it a little bit closer, it doesn't look terribly horrible. But it has to set up some lights for this because it looks a little bit flat and rendered. Right? 
Surprised they don't have one for Unity. Did it disconnect? Did you guys... Am I still broadcasting okay? Everybody still read me okay? One more hour, we're still gonna go. Yes, okay. So everybody reads me okay. Alright, again, let me know if you have any questions. I'll try to uh, answer, of course. So I'm gonna take a little bit of the leftover time uh, and show you guys kind of uh, some things that you can do with this. So after we went to Mixmo, here I'm gonna go back to it. Uh, now that we have a T-pose, we can use that T-pose to our advantage. We can use it to create some other movements and if we need additional movements, at least we have this as a basis, right? Because it's much quicker to upload the T-pose that's already been rigged and add additional movements than it is to set up an entirely new one. Right? So you have to go through the process that I was just going through. Right? Just uploading it, setting the markers, waiting it for it to run. And then once it adds the rig, you can use various animations. So like, for example, I'm going to type in search. I'm going to go like a female walk. And I can set a movement. And as you can see, it's already taking off. I can do it in place to keep it in one place. And this one's kind of weird. It seems like she's like uh, leaning back and walking forward. It's an interesting one. But uh, you can set the stride. You can slow the walk down. And actually, I'm going to mention something rather interesting. When you sculpt in ZBrush, if you should sculpt a, a character like a female character, that's wearing shoes with heels. Uh, there are a set of animations in Mixamo that do and don't work very well <laughs> for having heels. Uh, I will explain why. Uh, I sculpted this one with the intent and in ZBrush and putting it on the model. And so after I sculpted it and UV'd it and baked it out, I had to come back into ZBrush and bend the feet down so that we could, let's pick another one. There we go. You'll see that the model is actually moving as it should on its heel, right? There are, however, a few fashion-oriented poses in here, like the catwalk one. It looks great, but the unfortunate thing is it makes her stand on her tippy toes. And that's because the, I guess, the mocap data, the character was probably wearing high heels that are taller than what I've designed. So you may need to go back and tweak the position of keyframed uh, poses in the feet to make this properly work otherwise it makes it look a little bit like she's walking on her tippy toes unless you designed it that way it looks a bit odd uh, you could always fix this by probably taking the rig um, into your 3d editor uh, for those who are again a little bit more novice at, at animating inside of a 3d package and you probably have to take the rig and turn it the orientation of the foot literally and then rewrite or rebake the the keyframes in the animation because when you open this in an editor generally the keyframes look like they're pretty much baked in and it's basically just the the mesh trans transitioning along with those baked in frames of the rig like it all follows the the keyframes right but if you say want to edit the keyframes you need to select them for that bone and then delete them and then rewrite them basically and then you can sort of alter some of the, the. yeah, you're getting artifacts in it. Um, every once in a while, you might get it, some artifacts. And again, that, that does bring itself back to some of the weight painting. Um, I'm not sure if like this model might have had some weight paints in it before, but it's funny enough, when I place the markers, depending on how I, I place them, you might get some, some tweaked areas between the legs or stretching. Like if, uh, let's say for example, I come down and let's get like a crouched pose or something or an action pose. Yeah, we could do something like this, right? And we'll do it in place. And as you can see, as she's moving, there's a certain area between the crotch that is, it, it makes her, her legs look a little bit odd it's because the the rig that's placed on the inside is stretching along with the inside of the leg like there's not enough flexibility there to, to properly move to the shape so I probably need to go in to blender and set up some constraints or a bone outside of the hip and in back of the hip 
Um, and there's some really good links on, on doing weight painting on the web. I would suggest anybody taking a moment to kind of watch them. I need to do the same and follow my own advice. <laughs> but it can be done to sort of fix some of the deforming errors in the mesh. You know, even though it was sculpted quite properly and it, and it looks great, uh, some of the topology might not uh, bend itself you know, already without proper weighting. Right? So it needs to be flexible enough to, to handle the shape of bending in such a manner or the limitation of how high the leg would come up humanly possible to bend without looking deformed and kind of crazy. Right? So I do suggest learning that and, and going through this for motion because sometimes it could just look too odd. But most for the, for the most part, if I run something very quick through here for you know, just concepting a character, you know, you can get some really nice walk cycles, uh, run cycles, that sort of thing. Here's one that I've used before for, for a female walk. It's pretty nice. And you can, you can alter the speeds of these and sometimes also the character arm space and get some really nice sort of poses out of them. Even, for example, like if you're working in ZBrush and you want to just uh, uh, get like an interesting, more natural uh, contrapposto or, or pose out of a, a character, you could probably take this and then just pause it and and then export you know just that pose and have a nice walking pose inside of zbrush right you can save like something like this out of maya or max or blender and get into zbrush um, you can probably fix and or reposition some of the hands but the the rig definitely does help if you just you know if you want something natural just pause it on a on a certain frame in the middle and you would have you know at least a basic pose that looks a little bit natural so and they do have other poses in here just for that purpose for illustrative purposes so it's kind of cool to use especially in, if you're doing paint overs or that sort of thing thank you <laughs> have to run to the store thank you okay i could totally understand that one but uh let's move along okay so now that we've got this downloaded here i'll actually grab Let's grab this one. Let's download this one. And we know the UVs work on this one, so I'll download it. And so we have a walking pose. I'll come into uh, to Marmoset once again. And I'll grab the downloaded FBX it loads in I drop the t same material and then say for example if I get the timeline out down here here where you can adjust your keyframes and here's the linear timeline and you can play it and there's your walk cycle All right uh, additionally let's say we need to turn on a few things high dpi uh, i'll go one to one for the resolution 4x temporal yes uh, local reflection, sure. Enable global illumination, sure. Uh, ambient occlusion, sure. Oop. We'll go to two. And then uh, that should be good. And then I'll take sky and pick a different sky. Let's get something a bit more dramatic. Right. And I can grab that little piece of light there and fix it later. But pretty much just what I want is like some lights that'll be kind of positional. And I'll hit done here. And I'll pause it there. And then these, of course, you can always turn them up or crank them up.
And you can set up each light along the HDR axis way. And also sky, I'm going to just knock out the blurred background and just use the light. So I'll change this to black. I'll change this to color. And additionally, I can get some other effects out of messing with the post-processing and the camera settings. So like say for the bloom and or vignette or grain uh, focus, you know, like if you want uh, depth of field. I'm going to change the near blur down and the far blur just a little bit more down. Not too, not too blurry. There we go. And then I may take this and do something like um, you can put on, turn on the safe frames and just check your, your framing. But you can also use different cameras. Let's say I want to go from 28, which is, seems to be the default, and do something like uh, 75. It's like a wider lens. And let's see. I'm going to add some distortion. A little chromatic ab. And uh, maybe, just maybe. Let's say I take this one and hide it and keep the other here, the walking one. And we'll focus in on this one and I'll bring this, oops. Let's grab the whole model and bring it in. There we go. And then of course there are ways to make a turntable of this really quickly. Um, Marmoset is a great tool for this. I, I always um, end up here, especially after ZBrush, uh, to check models, whether I'm texturing or not. Sometimes it's interesting just to proof them by taking a, an interesting little quick game style render or something like that that you can use in artwork. But it's, it's, you, you can totally use a lot of these um, uh, tools to, to make just a still image or even a motion clip. Um, and I say that because there are times when I have comped uh, videos together where all of the animations were placed inside of uh, Marmoset. And then from here I made a PNG sequence and went straight to After Effects in some cases. Like, uh, let's show you guys uh, a really quick video that I have. You might, guys might dig this one. You've probably seen me play it before, but... Uh, bring this one in here here we go so like for example last time I was talking about some of these other character models that I've done and I've already um, rendered them out um, this is kind of like how they turn out and just make like little uh, small vignette <laughs> clips of these but it, just to give you an example of you know what you can do, all of the video for this was uh, just captured right out of Marmoset, right? So for like a character design purposes, if you're concepting something and you want to take a look at it in motion to to look, I would almost these days rather uh, do like a 3D sculpt uh, based off of you know just like a quick rough and, and 2D, and then you know create a character this way, get it to move. Uh, there's something in, I don't know with concept art when motion is applied it just adds like a different uh, uh, reality or perception of, <laughs> of that character as a design you get to see how it moves it gives it a little bit more character the way it carries itself uh, it sort of comes out at least to me but uh, so it's kind of cool to, to do some things like this where you can make it move uh, beforehand right? So let's say, for example, I'm going to take this model uh, and select it. And what you're looking at is the, the the group of objects. So in other words, the where it says Geta Zori Low, this is the actual low mesh for the outside boot, uh, or the boots themselves. And then there's the actual heel down position mesh of the girl, um, which I came back and edited. Like I said, I needed to point her, her feet downward for the boots. 
and then pair them in, and then into a file and then rig it <laughs> so that they move together. But generally also if you wanted to add something separate, if you build say the shoes and then bent the feet, you could always pair the animation itself by going in and importing the shoes with this model separately into the same uh, 3D package and then once they're overlapping at the start position you could just parent them to the actual bone uh, on the rig on the inside and it will move with the object. I'm not going to explain that one today, that, that's actually a little bit involved and I need to open up Blender to probably do it, but uh, I will get to that one next time around. Because uh, parenting objects can be a little bit uh, dodgy, but it's pretty easy to do, but I just want to be able to, to pay attention to it specifically. Um, just for example sake, I want to jump ahead just for a moment uh, and show you guys something. Uh, here's another video, uh, just for example sake, of how and what I did once this thing got a rig on it. Um, and for those of you who know me or follow me over Facebook, you might have seen this one, so I apologize. I don't want to spam, but uh, this is what it looks like. So when I started, I just tried to imagine rendering some of these with a few um, movements, you know, just like walk cycle or just pose. And it gives me an idea of the lighting scenario and or uh, how light and, and whatnot hit these maps on the model. And then now I'm concentrating on some of the accessories. Um, I wish I could log in from my other computer. Uh, I'd show you some of the more uh, bones, the, gut, <laughs> the meat and guts of this. But I'm actually slowly putting on uh, a clothing design on this character. And I think I'll save that one for next time. But in Marmoset, I actually have uh, another file that's like this uh, with all the maps applied. And then there are cloth sims that I'm doing in Marvelous. Um, and probably next time around, unfortunately, on the machine that, that is my main machine, I, I, my Marvelous license is on newer machine, and so I would have to literally flip foot machines to jump into that. But uh, I will be going from ZBrush into Marvelous and doing some cloth items uh, to put into the design. Um, along so that, you know, we have a, a pairing between the boots and, and the cloth. Here, I'm going to jump need to open up. Move out of the way, you. Here we go. I lost my window for my playlist. Ah, there we go. So this is just another example. It's a probably a little bit better of a render where I've actually parented the blade to the hand and got it to move. So I just kind of slowed it down so that you could see the steps, but yeah, there's a few areas that still need to be fixed. Uh, just weights uh, in the character and a few like posing problems with the hand. I'm not sure if anybody caught it because it moves so fast. And if you know, uh, sometimes with motion blurring and stuff turned on, uh, you you probably don't see it. But there's there's an area right about here where I'm still working on some of the hand position because the fingers got a little gimped. And then I just parented the blade to the hand and tested the movement just to get a, a sort of comp view of how it, it will end up. So still got a, a few repairs to do. But um, does anybody have any questions? Have I tried mixturing for texturing? Yes, yes indeed I have. Uh, and what do I use for baking maps? Okay, so for bake maps, I'm using Nald. Um, I'm also using the baker inside of Substance. Uh, and every once in a while, from Nald, I'll go to the old Quixel suite and still use some of the materials there. Uh, but I also have been utilizing Megascans with uh, Mixer. Um, and in fact, I will show you some. 
really quick. Um, let me see here. I'm going to save this one just before we get to beyond. Beep, 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 beep. One of the interesting things uh, for next time I have going on, um, this project that I've been working on silently for a little bit, um, I have some guest meshes from a couple of other friends, um, like uh, Edon Grozoy and also Mike Nash. They've been seriously kind enough to lend me a few of their, their concept meshes for a few characters. And I've paired them with a few of my own. And so inside of the project, I have not just meshes by myself, but a few other friends as well that I have contributed. And I want to thank them, but also it's totally awesome that they, they let me even touch those meshes. So a great, great amount of, of gratitude to them for that. But uh, all things that I'm probably going to soon get to and show you guys, because I'm really excited for a couple of other characters that I've been working on. Uh, to share them with you here in ZBrush Live. So, hang on a second, I just wanted to save this out. Uh, in its right place. Let's see. There we go. There we go. I'm going to just save an extra copy of this render somewhere so I can open up another and something else I've been working on that I did want to share with you guys um, did a really cool uh, character that I kind of put on ice for some time I think I did it in like 2014 and uh, brought it back and kind of worked on it for a little bit but I wanted to show it to you guys because a lot of what I've t been talking about I, I prepped it in much the same way and here's an example of one that I did alongside Mike Nash so the the trooper guy is one of my own sculpting invention inside of ZBrush uh, the sword originally I think I did in ZBrush uh, or Z, Z modeler using the Z modeler and over time I've probably remeshed it but uh, that's where it was sourced out. The cloth bit comes from a uh, uh, marvelous designer. It's just a simple like overcoat, you know, cloak for the character, and then all of the character itself is just a manifold mesh. And boots there, treads underneath, and then Mike Nash uh, designed and gave me the dog. And right now I'm trying to work through possibly creating a, a rig for a dog character. <laughs> Doesn't, it's funny enough that there's not that much mocap data out there for dogs, so I might have to get in there and somehow figure out how to animate a quadruped dog uh, with the idea of it having robo joints and whatnot, so that'll be interesting. But uh, in the same way, all of these were baked out and um, uh, probably run through all three steps, uh, you know, substance designer mixer in fact the, the base for the material for this dog is all mixer and then it was moved over to substance where I applied a few other materials actually no uh, Quixel Suite mixer and then substance for the decals and emissives and uh, all running through all three apps you know just messing with the maps saving them out and then re-importing them again and doing a little bit more detailing and then finally bam you get cyber dog and this one I think I had to uh, run through Instalod to, to do it because it was quite a, a complex uh, amount of shapes uh, to try to Z remesh and so I just used sort of more of a, a manifold simple solution and just uh, baked over the same the, the, the entire mesh but probably it would be best to break up some of the components so that it wouldn't be a manifold mesh so just like say one one leg with three joints you know or four joints attached to it and separate these pieces or segments uh, do one for the head and for the chest and the tail section individually uh, and then bring each of those parts together so that at least they're separate so that you can rig and movement would be probably the best I'm actually gonna try this see if I can uh, rig this in such a way where it still works as a manifold uh, like at least within game engine um, but I might end up separating it and applying the same textures, right? 
But it looks pretty cool. You can get this guy posed up. Um, I believe. Does he move? I thought this one moved. That's pretty crazy. It should have moved. This guy is not moving. That's strange. Should have had an animation track to him. But I can turn on some of the others that move. Ah, here we go. I think there was one row of guys that I had that had com complete movements to them, but there was one pose that I probably put in that didn't just for pose sake. But you can get them to do all kinds of things. It's great. And most of the maps hold pretty well. I'm going to skip back and see if you guys had any questions. How do I do the animations for the dog-like creature? Mixamo will not do that. Uh, unfortunately, it will not. Um, I wish it did, but like I was saying, uh, because of the nature of it being a quadruped, unless you had mocap data that was quadrupedic, <laughs> of like an actual dog or something, it may not work. Um, even if you, you could possibly, and this, this would be odd, you could possibly capture two legs from one rig and pair it and retarget those legs onto each set of legs and then make them move, but I don't think that they would move in sync with each other. It would be better just to make a rig, study a dog animation, um, like maybe if you grab something for reference, um, I would take, say, for example, YouTube and grab a dog animation, maybe as a keyword. Or a dog walk cycle, maybe. And look at that. Like this one, I think I found before. And it was added some very nice animation motions for the key animation of a dog moving. And then maybe I could use these planes to plot out the actual motion of the rig and then see how it looks. <laughs> that would be probably literally my approach. So you're using the high poly models for this. No, I'm not. Actually, um, it's, kind of, it's kind of hard to explain. Uh, let me do this. I'm going to make a nice little note in Photoshop. Photoshop. There we go. Alexa, set nest to 73 degrees. The AC is set to 73. And let's see. Okay. So basically, it's something like this. I'm going to make a little note in Photoshop here. print page here we go okay so it works like this so I need a high resolution and I need a low right and what the baker is going to do is it's going to compare those two and it's going to take the high detail and it's going to project it onto the low, right? So here we either have uh, OBJ, FBX, right? And then here we have high OBJ or FBX, depending on what case you need either, right? And basically, this is going to be the comparison for this one. So all of the high is going to get baked on to the, the UV space and the maps for the low. 
So what is that, either zero or maybe one, right? And the high is the same way. The high um, doesn't have to have UVs, actually. Uh, and then I use Photoshop uh, to basically look at the maps afterwards, but uh, ZBrush, sorry. Yeah. I'm not writing right today. What's wrong with me? Here we go. We'll use ZB for color maps. So color IDs. And we'll use it for UV. Uh, usually quick or auto UVs. I mean, we can make exact UVs for a character inside of ZBrush. You know that. But there are also other things that we can use to, to do it. So like, um, pretty much ZBrush is handling creating a high and a low for me. And then I also do color IDs inside of it because uh, if you guys recall once before I did this in ZBrush, you can take uh, a model, say for example, and based off of the um, based off of the the poly groups, you can come down to the lower part of the tool menu, and you can use either poly groups with auto groups, and then merge similar groups. Uh, like say if you have different parts or something like that. In this case, I've already poly grouped this, so I'm not going to mess with this, but. Uh, I can also go to poly paint uh, and I won't save it like this but if I hit uh, uncheck the the gradation and I'll use colorize and click it and then turn on poly paint uh, or check poly paint from poly groups and basically what it'll do is it'll um, put a fill a randomized fill into each area right and I can use those filled areas as uh, as fills for different materials, right? Uh, yeah, that's because the the marmoset environment where I'm loading them, I'm loading the high here, and I'm applying the the high bake onto it, right? So like really, the the mesh would be probably quite low if I was to take uh, this and drop it on here. You could see that this this is what the raw mesh the the looks like right and this one actually I ran it through Instalod so it's been chopped down and optimized a little bit in tries and then you know all of the detail comes from the normal that that was baked right cool 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 yep so then I just take the once I bake it take and drop it on and it's pairing everything to the UV space and so all of those nice little details are what's been what what has been baked in, right? And if I if I save a, something in Instalot, it will save LODs of things. Uh, basically, it'll crunch down and optimize the geo much like uh, Decimation Master, but it'll also do a bake. And I can take that procedural bake onto Substance or Quixel Suite, um, and you know with the color IDs, I can add materials and details, even do a little normal sculpting here and there. Um, straight onto the mesh and then look at it in marmoset right so it's it's pretty pretty easy to do uh, and the interesting thing is I'll be doing a little bit of hopscotch here in the future um, I kind of wanted to go through a primer of doing some stuff in marmoset and jumping from ZBrush to marmoset but also utilizing uh, Mixamo and if you've never used it how it works um, and so that's it's pretty much what I wanted to cover but um, I also want to get later into some of the other steps, and that's adding accessories after the fact, after you've done everything through Mixamo. Uh, so I will be getting to some of the cloth and like accessory stuff, like adding a blade, because it's it's pretty neat. Um, it's fairly easy to do, and you can pair it um, to the mesh quite easily, right? Uh, let me see if I can open up another example. Uh, open up Space Guy. I think I open up. The space guy last time around but I didn't spend too much time talking about it mm. I go into marmoset tool bag open another one yeah, let's see open up the scene and now let's see exo trooper Cyberdog. 
Where's my space dude? I can't find my space guy. It's crazy. Male dude, straight female. Bup, 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 bup. Yeah, this is generally where I have a few characters saved out, but uh, there are a couple of other characters, so many that I need to organize, or I've, I've actually moved them already into Unreal, and they're all organized there, so I forget some of their names, <laughs> the file names, to, to go surfing through the directories. Uh, it has a few pieces that are missing, because I'm opening it here from a different machine. Sorry, let's open up another one, for example. Here's a nice one. I think you guys may remember me doing this one. So this is a, actually a little bit slightly different, but part of the same process. I created the big guy here. This is just a, a quick character. Um, I used actually Adobe Fuse for this, and it's kind of a, a neat thing, but I've been experimenting with using such, um, using just Fuse for like basic character, like uh, kind of like creating extras or background extras. Uh, and sometimes I'll go in there and I'll use some of the scans from it, but you could totally actually take a lot of those poses uh, and bring them into ZBrush and edit them. Uh, there's a lot of like crazy little, you know, uh, like the brute model in there is kind of neat to toy with, uh, and you can actually shift proportionally some of the the human proportions around, like uh, hand size or calf size. You, you know, you can set them by a slider. It almost works kind of like Adobe's uh, version of maybe a poser type of app or a Daz type of app. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just take the the model um, and T pose it really quick, and from Fuse you can hit makes them quite direct like it'll actually export it directly to it and then once I have that base pose and, and whatnot I can bring it back to ZBrush and actually do some custom things on it and you guys have actually seen me do that um, before I think but this one is pretty neat you know just like it has motion on it I can toss this guy onto a blueprint and have him moving around in Unreal uh, I can bring him into Substance even and add some additional things to his maps so I created a, a custom map uh, separate to the, the base one that they kick out and uh, applied it to the, the model. And it, it will actually work within PBR space or you can bring it into Substance and do more with it. You know? So pretty cool stuff for that. Um, and then once you import it again, maybe just touch up some of the materials. But in some cases it'll actually um, import, like the FBX will hold the maps and it will actually parse out you know, separate materials for you, like uh, say for the glove or the shoe, um, and then maybe I just might have to add some of the additional stuff like uh, either specular maps or something like that if, if it offers it. Um, I might double up on the PBR stuff and add other you know, spec specular styled maps and stuff like that for, for the look. But it's pretty easy to do and pretty easy to kick out, and I uh, would like to encourage all of you to try it. Let me know how it works out for you. Man's got swagger. He does have a lot of swagger. He's he's like a, In fact, a, I use this guy as a model to uh, present uh, one of the noodle bar stages I think I created uh, in my city scene. There's like a an entire map that has like a, a like a little food court area in, in my project, and um, he's one of the customers at the the little noodle bar stand but interestingly enough I, I might use him as a as an extra elsewhere but most of most of these characters that I've been creating some of them I've wanted to use uh, as extras or, or scene extras and so I'm, I'm very quickly trying to sculpt a lot of models very quickly and get them wrapped with a at least a, a sort of pseudo camera look um, so that you know they, w they wouldn't look too horrible if they were you know, a fair amount close up, but also they they would totally blend into the background as regular, you know, populated human space. Uh, it is not my go-to render. Actually, I use uh, it for most of the stuff that I moved to Unreal that I'm trying to toy with right now. I use Marmoset Render to render it, 
Um, it's very handy, but it's not my go-to. I, I have actually been branching out and trying to use more uh, renderers like Octane, uh, also Redshift. Um, Redshift, I think I have to use with Cinema 4D, but that's one that I'm, I'm trying to undertake the, the learning on. Um, and I have used Keyshot previously, but I, I've kind of left it behind a little bit uh, as I've been doing more like GPU rendering. Uh, and I know Keyshot has probably come up with their own uh, GPU rendering it inside of that render, but uh, I haven't used it in some time now. But uh, any other questions? I think I'm going to probably kill it a few minutes early, but if you guys have any questions or have anything specific you wanted to ask me, I'm here at the ready to answer. Uh, for PBR, yes, indeed. So like, um, say for example, this, this map here, let me actually open another one and we'll take a look at it. One that maybe has more complete stuff. The exoskeleton, uh, exo trooper guy with the dog. Uh, no. That one I will show here. It's probably along those lines where it has color IDs and whatnot. So this is the color ID trooper, yeah? And this is everything, I think probably low. I'm still in my recent. But this is the low that, that I have that's merged. And so when I saved out this mesh, there's actually a high in here as well. Uh, let's see, where is it? This one? Oop. Yeah, see how this is a little bit smoother? And if I actually select that part of the mesh and hit shift F, you'll see that all of this has been decimated, right? So I decimated the entire model uh, once I was done with the color, you know, built in. But this one, I think I, I might have put in different groups on each side, but the selections were equal and I just doubled up on the color selection inside of substance or something like that. But generally, everything has their its own color to, to signify a, a, a material, right? Like a material breakout. Uh, and again, it has been filled down here. Um, you know, like an auto group and then merge similar groups maybe would probably work. Uh, and then hit colorize. And I undo the gradation because sometimes the, the edges of the color fills would maybe otherwise get a little aliased. So I uncheck that, hit colorize and poly paint from poly groups, and it will go in and put a vertex color for each selection, right? Uh, yes, I have. So like, say for example, I'm gonna take this guy as an example, right? Uh, I actually think I have the project of that saved around. I need to open it up. I'll have a look. We'll try to open something for an example. Yeah. Uh, the pilot, perhaps. All right. So the, I think this is one file. This is probably not the final file. I think I actually moved it to a different machine, but as you can see, this was like sort of the basic setup. And a good thing about this one is I don't, this copy of this file is I don't have to re-import anything, it's all here. But as you can see, probably, let's see, let me see if I can scroll this down. There's a material ID here. And if I collapse some of these. So everything's been plugged in. So that, that metalness, roughness, displacement, normal, occlusion, curvature, and the color ID is, is the basic set of things that I start with, right? Uh, and then the color ID, if I hit in Mixer 8, you can see where the colors have been broken up. Okay? And so these become the IDs that I select on each material. So let's say, for example, if I go and I get a new material from local library or something like that, something that I've already downloaded, 
I can probably take nickel and add uh, a color ID onto it. Is that a series of, yeah, I guess it is, okay. So I think on this, you can add an ID mask and then basically you gotta go pick the color. So like say for a lot of the doodads here, I think I selected nickel. What is that, like a light green, pastel green. I'll select it, it'll make a mask, and you, see, you can barely see it, but it's actually masked out just that color. And if I hit one, you can see that the material has been applied just in that specific area, right? And so I can give even the suit a different, you know, material or something like that. Uh, substance, yeah, I think I think I actually bought a license of it. It was a, just a tad over 300 or something like that. Last year, I, I finally picked it up. I was like, ah, you know, should learn and get into substance, and so I think I'll go that way. But, yeah, I want actually to talk more with you guys about Mixer because I think it's such a cool developing tool that, that is coming to light that uh, you can do some really nice, like, um, basic textures from it and some live painting stuff with it. Um, I still have need, I think, to go back to the older Quixel suite for it, but that's probably just my own uh, desire to use a few materials out of out of that still uh, to use and, and apply on a model because they there are some really great uh, material groups uh, and you know like material uh, materials inside of Quixel suite that I, I would hate to leave behind and some customs that I've made there as well but mixer also um, is is it just really nice robust new tool it's very easy to use the only thing i really want to see out of it more is a little a, a few little more details towards uh decals and, and stamping um and also maybe the pressure sensitivity on wacom has at some points been a little bit difficult but it is otherwise a really awesome tool and very powerful to use yeah. especially in conjunction with zbrush because all your cool you know fancy high res stuff that you can get out of Z, ZBrush, um, you know, you can really bring it to life using these applications like Mixer, like Substance. Uh, and, and just the difference would be, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding. Once you put some textures on it and, and it starts to look a lot more realistic, it, it grad, gradually has more depth uh, and is very satisfying to look at. Okay. Well, guys, save your questions. I'm going to actually cut it just a, by a few minutes early. But thank you for joining me, and I hope you guys all stay safe from the corona. Thanks again to Pixelogic for hosting these streams. Really enjoy um, spending time with you guys and sh sharing my own creativity with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, he's actually already in, in Unreal. I got the helmet down, everything. Uh, I kind of sculpted him basic this way and then sculpted a, a helmet secondary and then textured both and put it together and I will talk about that more. There's some really cool uh, opacity Mac tricks uh, that will take some time to explain in substance but um, I think uh, pretty soon we'll, we'll get to it and you know do more uh, ZBrush Live sculpting, sculpting and going into these apps but I just wanted to provide a stream where I give you guys a little bit of background more than you know just going in and applying uh, sculpting right away because you know at least you'll have some frame of context next time around. <laughs> so cheers. All right. Well, thanks for joining me. Uh, I will be back soon, and we'll continue from there. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Dope -dope. Oh, I got to kill this thing. Have a good one. All the unreal great stuff is this great stuff. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, guys. Take care.